fun to see a variety of people from all over the world um, now in this one webinar together, such as the body of Christ, right? So let us begin with prayer. Loving God, through the waters of baptism, you draw us out of the captivity of sin and death into the freedom of new life in Christ as a beloved community of disciples. Dios de amor, a través de las aguas del bautismo, nos rescataste de la esclavitud del pecado y de la muerte y nos has liberado para que como comunidad de amados tuyos podamos tener vida en abundancia. By the grace of this sacrament, empower us, we pray, to bear witness to your love in our lives and to carry on Christ's work of healing and reconciliation in the world, rejoicing to know that we are marked as Christ's own forever. Por la gracia de este sacramento, damos la fuerza para dar testimonio de tu amor reconciliador en nuestra vida, para que seamos las manos sanadoras de Cristo en este mundo, y para que lo hagamos todo con el gozo de saber que llevamos la marca indeleble de, lo que, de los que son de Cristo para siempre. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for being here with us today. Um, we want to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Joy Mel Gonzalez Hernandez. I am a priest. Um, in Washington, D.C., and uh, for five years, I joined uh, Baptized for Life, Vida en Abundancia, um, working with communities of faith um, around the country in discerning their baptismal identity and vocation. Uh, I was, as I put in my chat, I was baptized in my um, home country in Cuba, um, in the Presbyterian Church, and um but i also um remember a lot as a moment um a special moment my confirmation in the episcopal church in the national uh, washington national cathedral as a special moment hello everyone i'm kim arakawa and i was the bfl project manager for the last six years it was a, a true honor and joy and um, a gift to have been able to grow alongside so many wonderful people uh right now i am also the project manager for two other grants uh mutual ministry initiative and the preaching congregations initiative within the department of lifelong learning i was baptized in milwaukee wisconsin i moved to hawaii when i was seven and that is where I am geographically located. I am VTS's most remote employee, and I get to work on being committed to lay leadership um, through the work with lifelong learning and my diocese in Hawaii. And I'd like to add my welcome. I'm Lisa Kimball. I am currently the vice president for lifelong learning and professor of lifelong Christian formation at Virginia Seminary. And it was my privilege to be the director of the Baptized for Life initiative which, as Kim said, was a six-year-long journey. It was actually almost more like a seven-year-long journey in the discernment that led to writing it and then gathering people that were involved in it. My baptism was when I was just under six months old at St. Clement's Episcopal Church in Berkeley, California. The same day that my father was confirmed in the Episcopal Church, my mother was the, the long-standing Episcopalian, and my dad kind of migrated over from the Congregational Church. And um, sometimes I am considered to be kind of rabid about baptism. Um, I'm a little serious about this stuff. And I think what I'm really serious about is the priesthood of all believers, that at our best, the body of Christ understands the significance of every member of all ages and all backgrounds um, serving in this community of the body of Christ for the sake of God's mission in the world. So this initiative comes from my heart and from our shared work and enterprise. Many of you on the webinar were part of it directly or indirectly. And um, let me tell you a little about what we're gonna do today. We um, This is not a report on the grant per se. Uh, this is sort of a next iteration of our learning from it. 
And particularly, we are excited to share with you things that we think we learned by living out the Baptized for Life experience that helps activate baptism in local communities and to share some of the resources that we developed or that we have curated. There will be a Google folder that you will be given access to following the webinar with all the resources that we're suggesting and telling you about and more. Um, so all of those are free, they're accessible, they're downloadable, they're video and digital and print, um, but they are resources that we have curated and put together for you. So this initiative, what is it exactly? How did we get to this day where we are wanting to talk so much about activating baptism? As many of you know, um, the church is uh, very diverse and our churches are very small and some, not that many, but some are very large and everything in between. Not all churches are in buildings, but many are. Um, some churches have paid clergy and many, many don't. And it was clear to me over many years of ministry in the church and listening to seminarians, listening to alumni from our seminary and colleagues and others out in the church, that there's a gap between what people who even do come to faith communities, do worship with us, really know about their faith and what we say we believe. And this project was about trying to close that gap, trying to help people understand that they are worthy and beloved in God's eyes, that they have gifts right now for ministry in the places where God has called them to be. And that we believe that by coming alongside congregations and faith communities and reminding them of the significance of their baptism, which we hoped to do more fully with the catechumenate that ties baptism to worship and to the rhythm of the liturgical year than we were able to do because of COVID. But nonetheless, the practices of an ongoing liturgical life were something that was always at the heart of what we wanted to offer. We wanted people to know that the rhythm of being church together is in fact what can form us to understand how our baptism shapes the way we live. And if our baptism is shaping the way we live, it's shaping our vocation. It's shaping the choices we make in daily life. It's shaping the way we witness to the love of God in and among the people we encounter. So Baptized for Life was an opportunity to accompany these places that you see on the map. A variety of dioceses across the church participated. And in each diocese, the six dioceses, we had a number of faith communities. I say faith communities because they were not all conventional, traditional congregations. We had a house church that became a barn church. We had a campus ministry. We had a cathedral. We had a larger, you know, well program sized parish that was in a kind of suburban community. We had two historically African American congregations. We had two multilingual congregations with strong Latino communities um, for which Joy Mel was our catechist. Um, we had congregations that were urban and rural. We had a congregation in Michigan that Jan is here participating from um, that was what was called a total ministry congregation, a congregation that had come together as a ministry team and raised up local leadership, including its clergy. So we had a large variety of people and commitments to what it meant to be church. But in each diocese, the bishop was committed to this work and someone on the diocesan staff worked with us as the liaison. And we called them our sponsor for Baptized for Life and Vida en, en Abundancia, which was our Latino Spanish language interpretation of this. Um, and so here we are six years later. And what we really want to do is begin to share with you some of the reflections of what we learned from this experience. I think most important at the core of what we did over the years accompanying these faith communities is that as a core team of people who were directing the project, catechists who were the guides, the mentors, the partners with the faith communities and the sponsors on the ground in each diocese, we believed that we needed to walk the talk. We needed to practice what we believed we were hoping to invite the faith communities to consider at the heart of the Christian life are Christian practices. And that what is what we've discovered was transformative. When we lived the practices ourselves of prayer and discernment and being attentive to God, what we discovered was that congregations were transformed. Yeah. From the beginning of the BFL grant project, we were clear about centralizing prayer. 
So two members of our core leadership team, Francie, Francie Thayer, who's on the call today, and Rodney Dean, were spiritual directors from the retreat house in the Diocese of Easton, and they were active with our congregations for the entire grant time. Uh, Francie and Rodney ensured we were all grounded in reflective spiritual practices. In 2023, BFL focused on resource creation as we moved to sustaining the work for the wider church through our activating baptism efforts. So today, we have several resources to share with you done in partnership with practitioners from the Retreat House, three of which are short videos that you will be sent in your Google folder after this webinar. Here is the first one for Easter, using the spiritual practice of a resurrection garden. On that first Easter morning, the Gospel tells of a garden scene where the tomb is rolled away and Jesus rises from the dead. Mary Magdalene mistakes the risen Jesus for a gardener, but then he says her name, Mary, and she recognizes him. Jesus sends her to preach the good news to others, I have seen the Lord. In holy baptism, we too are called by name find union with Christ in his death and resurrection, and are sent to confess Christ crucified and proclaim his resurrection. Each Easter, my family likes to make a visual reminder of how our lives through baptism grow and bloom and tell of new life in the risen Jesus. We plant a resurrection garden and recreate that Easter morning scene by the empty tomb. A resurrection garden can take many forms, each including plants, crosses, and an empty tomb. Perhaps plant an indoor succulent garden and watch it grow and bloom. Or gather seasonal flowers to place by your front door or plant along a walkway. For an edible spin, plant the seeds or small plants of herbs, fruits, or vegetables harvest when ready, and then taste the fruits of resurrection, or share with others. Or support the interdependent community of life by building a native plant garden. Watch as the garden provides habitat for creatures and blooms for pollination. Mary Magdalene met the risen Lord Jesus in a garden. May the garden your family plants also be a meeting point between you and Jesus as you live more fully into your baptisms, confessing the faith of Christ crucified and proclaiming his resurrection. Thank you, Josh. We have a wonderful support person in the background. We're really grateful. So I, um, I want to share this wonderful resource for Kim to tell you about. Thank you so much. So what you see on the left right here is the first page, an image capture of the first page of one of the documents. This is the document that goes alongside the video you just saw. Uh, and then you will notice on the right side that we have a list. There are written guides to accompany, accompany the baptismal feast day videos to nurture congregation-wide practices at home. And this list also shows you uh, what will be available in the Google folder from the activating baptism resources that we partnered with the Retreat House for. So you'll see All Saints and All Souls has an accompanying video uh, that you won't see today. So you'll get to see that when you look into our folder, the Easter, Resurrection Gardens document and video that you just saw. And then we'll be showing you a Pentecost video shortly that also has a document that goes with it to help you with that spiritual practice. There's also um, robust information about Godparents, living and dying, conversation with God's help and the covenant of love. 
In addition to these resources that were newly created this year, uh, we also put in the Google folder for you other resources that we have shared along the way with our BFL journey. So you'll see Christian Life of Faith. Lisa will talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's a very robust breviary and then additional resources with God's help, a sample practice of the well, which we'll also talk about a little bit more. One of our really favorite prayers for our journey, trust in the slow work of God. Uh, we have a PDF in there for you. And, and then there's also a lot to uh, access from our activating baptism section of the Department of Life and Learning on VTS's website. Thank you. Do continue to put questions or comments in the chat. There's a number of us here and a lot of you have a lot of experience. So we'll have a chance in a moment for you to begin to engage with us in this. Um, but we welcome, yes, Kim. One thing I just remembered I wanted to share. Oh, good. We have um, all of the resources, the Activating Baptism resources have uh, PDFs, but we also chose to put the Word documents in there for you. Because if you do, you know, you're trying to put together a bulletin or you're trying to put together a workshop, um, we want you to be able to use this easily. So please feel free to cut and paste this information from the Word doc. And if you would just be so kind as to put an attribution to VTS and the Department of Lifelong Learning, we would deeply appreciate that. We're going to share with you now what we would call like high level learnings from our experience of the baptized for life journey. And I think many of you will say, this isn't rocket science, but when you, what we've learned is that what we learned again, or learned for the first time in some cases, are learnings, I keep to overuse this word, but they are learnings that have to be taken seriously. They themselves become spiritual practice. The commitment to believe and to practice and to inhabit what you're about to hear is a commitment that is very countercultural. And so we are here reminding you of things you probably know, and that in your ministries, you are helping others remember. And together, when we live this way, God is remarkably present and people's lives are changed. There's no question. So we're going to take turns and share some of the things that were most meaningful to us as we watched across the six years and learned alongside of others. A very, very centralizing theme for us um, that our spiritual directors held uh, in deep reflection was slowing down, slowing down. Um, over and over again, we returned to that understanding that it was necessary to trust in the slow work of God, um, creating space for being overdoing, prioritizing listening. Yeah, well, that the other um, thing that we um, encounter all the time in connection with the congregations and groups we were working with was the how the foundational practices of prayer, um, dwelling in with the scripture, practicing personal and community discernment uh, and participating in the Christian community allow the individuals and the congregations and groups um, to see um, the world and the church and their faith uh, in a different uh, way. Um, as it was mentioned before, since the beginning, our core team was supported by a spiritual that directors um, who helped each of, each of us and the project and the groups in prayer. But they were not only like, um, you know, that these experiences of chaplains, while there is a conference, that they meet in a different room to pray for everything that is happening. It was not that model. They were really part of our group. Um, they, um, they were part of the designing uh, and in, implementing resources. They help us um, create a vocabulary about how to name um, um, spiritual practice that we're, we were sharing with the congregations. They, um, they were an um, integral part of all this process. And I think that Baptized for Life, uh, Vida en Abundancia, the project was um, would not be the same if it was not for the presence um, of um, Francie, Rodney, and the rest of the group of the Retreat House who 
were part of the of this core team uh, the whole time. And this is something that we can also model that in in our in our groups in our in our congregations. Sometimes formation and worship or formation and prayer go um, in different paths uh, in our groups. And um, we try to uh, integrate both both paths and group uh, and groups in a more natural way. I was thinking as you were talking, Joanne um, do you remember the cathedral in the Diocese of Central Gulf Coast, right? So um, a cathedral, if any of you have ever served on a staff of a cathedral or been a worshiping member of a cathedral congregation, they're, they're an odd breed, right, of church because they have both typically a local congregation that, that feels that that's their church home, and then they also have a relationship to their wider church, to their diocese, and sometimes are tourist visiting spots. You know, you come in because they have a history, history to see. But um, I think I was, you were talking, I was thinking the cathedral really had a transformative experience uh, being invited to slow down as Kim said, and being invited to attend to the spiritual practices at the heart of the way they gathered. I remember one of the first meetings we had and we were on Zoom and, and they were lined up in chairs, kind of looking at a big screen and there was a formality between us. Um, there was a sense of um, urgency on their part that, well, okay, we've signed on, we're here. And, and I'm not telling any secrets that are out of, they would volunteer this story too. Um, you know, what are we going to get out of this? How is this going to make us better? We're really committed to the work. And it took it took months, right, of our working with each other to discover that really we weren't going to offer something shiny and a new silver bullet that was going to make everything. What we were going to do was invite them to notice where God was already working in their lives. And their particular stories are remarkable. Now, COVID was an interrupter for all of us, and it forced all of us outside um, in ways that we would not have been forced to be outside of our buildings. But because of their geographic location, they started to notice their neighbors. They started to be able to attend to being church together in practices that they took for granted with neighbors who had never been in the building. And I think that's just a really lovely example to me of places where, because we were beginning to notice and pay attention, uh, there were ways that they were able to reach new people and new people were able to inform their work and feel very much alive um, because of the, the consistency and the, the rootedness of that congregation. So, so the, the high level learning I'd like to share is, is related to that, which is the good news I took away from Baptized for Life is congregations can change. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but in a time which we all are aware of, of incredible anxiety about the decline of religious affiliation, about the shrinking of congregations, about the questions of sustainability, realistically, economic sustainability, and a fear that we don't have the leadership we need. What we discovered across all of our participating communities is that being committed to these very countercultural practices of slowing down, praying together, reading scripture together, offering to support one another in the vulnerable times in our lives, doing the very basic things that people of God in community do, but particularly marking the liturgical year and noticing what those stories in the arc of our liturgical year are telling us and teaching us and how they're speaking to us in our daily life. Those practices allowed people who'd been worshiping together in buildings for decades to come to know each other in a new way. They were able to set aside a fear about not having enough material resources and discovered that in fact, there were abundant spiritual resources. Simple things that are not gonna surprise you. COVID was happening. People in the Baptized for Life community, the local BFL teams that we met with regularly on Zoom said things like, am I allowed, lay people, am I allowed to lead morning prayer? Like, I, I have a prayer book. I was given it at confirmation, but I didn't, I've never used it. And we would say, yes, of course you're allowed to do that. And let's walk through it and let's talk about what it is and why it is what it is and what's the history of morning prayer in the daily office. And and helped we helped people find their voice, find the tools, and then gather other people, whether it was on Zoom or on a park bench or at a campus ministry where they could be together and socially distanced 
people were able to use gifts they had to meet the hunger that they had. Now, why is that important? It's important because being church is not comfortable in 2024. Being church, being the baptized people of God is not a way of being that is rewarded in a highly consumer-driven capitalist culture. And so these ancient practices that we were drawing from the early church, from the early catechumenate to form the faith of Christians, are, are very countercultural. And the idea of having a spiritual director, of having a spiritual companion, of being um, listened to deeply and not fixed, we all know how good that feels on the receiving end. So what does it look like in your local setting to slow down, shed some busy programming, and just invite people to gather around the gospel text for next Sunday and listen to it, read it a few times, have silence after each reading, and then say, what do you hear that God might be saying to you in these words? You don't have to be an expert in Bible. You don't have to understand Hebrew or Greek. You can read a translation you may never have heard before, and God will speak to you through that. But what we got to become more confident about was for the culture of churches to change, the leadership had to be intentional and committed to the work and had to model the practices themselves, which includes the vulnerability of insecurity and not knowing and, and wanting prayer to work and not feeling the immediate results of it and, and hanging in there with each other. So the spiritual direction, the holding space, the faithfulness of others on whose shoulders we stand is a practice that we tried to inhabit and then tried to remind people is always available. Another thing that we wanted to make sure to share with you uh, is that BFL showed the power of congregations whose lay leaders were recognized as having authority because of their baptism. These faith communities made intentional effort to create space for all gifts, clergy and lay, all gifts. Leadership in BFL communities flourished and burnout reduced because leadership was viewed as a circle, not a pyramid. And this is what in the other grant that I manage, we call mutual ministry, where there's a community of ministers instead of community gathered around a minister. It's powerful and BFL saw the fruits of that in action. So this, this project also um, was um, going on when our country experienced two shaking uh, moments in the life of everybody. One was COVID, as it was mentioned, and the other one was the whole racial awakening that we experienced um, um, during 2021, 2022, 2023. And, um, and through, that, through that process, we um, recognize how the spirit works through disorientation and distress and how um, going through those experiences really inspired uh, and made possible to accomplish things that we could never plan or strategize um, in advance. Uh, some of these groups and congregations, they plan way before the pandemic hit, I mean, a year before the pandemic hit, um, specific projects they wanted to, to implement. And of course that when COVID came, everything was like um, almost impossible to accomplish. So um, trying to work together in reimagining um, that work in um, discovering the real uh, call in the midst of a pandemic when um, um, physical spaces were closed uh, when the when the parishes and congregations couldn't meet person uh, in person was a a, a spirit led moment of of awakening. Uh, I remember two experiences with this. Uh, one was um, uh, and this there is a picture that we share sometimes. We we have we, we do not have it here now. Is uh, one of our congregations experienced like a um, so someone in the neighborhood vandalized um, a library food food pantry in 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 the in the image of a, those libraries we put outside, and it was what vandalized and how that experience of pain and disruption led them to be more involved 
um, with um, the community surrounding the church. And um, they created like a, an outdoor worship space in which they were more connected with their neighbors and led to a more involvement um, with what was happening outside. And they, they, they decided that closing themselves was not the right answer, but to be out there and to be um, good neighbors. Um, and another experience that I remember was this Latino congregation that um, was really affected during the pandemic. Um, it is in a, um, um, in a small town, so there's a lot of isolation, not many Latino congregations in the diocese, uh, long distances from one parish to the other. And after, after the pandemic, they realized that um, they need to fight that, that isolation. So they, they began this kind of journey of visiting other Latino congregations that were far away and to learn from them and to connect and to try to um, be, be empowered um, by the experiences of others uh, and disrupt isolation. Uh, and that was very a transformative transformative uh, experience for many of our con congregations as well. So for us, activating baptism, living into our baptismal vows, is um, a, it's a lifelong process for sure, but it's as simple as walking the talk of what we promised at the font or what others promised for us. And it takes practice, like anything. It's, it's in a congregation becoming a community that, that what I would say creates an ecology, a system of ongoing formation as disciples. It's not a one and done, you know, you get wet at the font and you're baptized and everything's going to be great. Um, it's not the prosperity gospel. It's not promising that God loves you more than somebody else because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's the hard work of following the way of Jesus in relationship to other Christians who are doing the hard work of being faithful in the world. And this idea of going toward the hardship, the challenge, facing some of the things that, that have isolated us or built up loneliness, that's the key. You activate baptism when you hold hands with God and with your neighbor and are moving toward the holy healing and redemption that God desires for the world. So we wanna show you another video. This is our Pentecost video. I see a hand raised, we'll get to you. In baptism, we pray to be filled with the holy and life-giving Spirit. We pray for the gifts of the Spirit, for an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love God, and the gift of joy and wonder in all God's works. With chrism and the sign of the cross, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Each ascension to Pentecost, my family prays for a deepening of the Spirit in our lives. We gather a candle to represent the Christ candle, candles for each of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and smaller candles for each of us. Sometimes we add devotional items like a cross, an image or icon, or incense so we can remember to let our prayers rise before God like incense. We pray that we too, by the might of the Spirit, will be lifted to God's presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. On the first day, we light the Christ candle and remember that Jesus is the light of the world. In each of the next days, we pray for a gift of the Holy Spirit Come, O Spirit of Wisdom. Come, Spirit of Understanding. Come, Spirit of Right Judgment. Come, Spirit of Fortitude. Come, O Spirit of Knowledge. 
become a spirit of reverence. Come, spirit of wonder and awe. After each day's prayer, we enjoy the light for a moment, either in song or in silence. On the last day of the prayer, the eve of Pentecost, each person lights their candle from a red candle and prays especially for that gift of the Holy Spirit in their life. In the baptismal covenant, we are asked if we believe in the Holy Spirit and if we'll continue in the prayers. To each we respond, yes. This ascension to Pentecost, pray these nine days of prayer with expectant faith, reaffirming that you do believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Maybe um, during all this conversation, you have been like thinking of a person that you know that uh, you think um, is a sign, is a is a witness of what activated baptism is, and I would like to invite you to um, put in your chat the name. Uh, of that person? Who is that person that reminds you of what um, a baptized disciple um, is? And we like to honor Bernard Osier. She was very close to our, our group. We read her books and uh, we were very, very, it was a very important person for sure, Mary Amos, J. Marshall. We want to honor these, these persons and their, their witness and um, their presence in our lives, their inspiration. They are people who um, we can um, learn from. Howard Gray, Howard Thurman, Father Ray Alexander, Mary Kim, Thank you for sharing those names. Dane, Virginia. Presiding Bishop Curry. I'm thrilled that we're naming some people who we know are lay people, and we're also naming some people we know are ordained or have taken monastic vows. I saw a Jesuit go by. Um, that's that's so important. One of the things we learned was that the clergy in our lives were renewed in their own sense of vocation, their particular vocation as a deacon or as a priest or as a bishop, because we invited them to go back up and pay closer attention to the core of their identity as a baptized Christian. And then those of us who live our lives fully as baptized Christians were empowered to recognize the authority of that. So I'm moved by the names that you're sharing. I don't know all their stories, but there, there's a variety there already. And I think that's that's really important. And th thinking about these names and these, these persons, um, the other question that we have is, what are some signs of activated baptism that you see in them? How um, do we... You know that phrase. We know. We know it when we see it. What is what is it in them that you um, that you can recognize um, the presence of this baptismal identity lived uh, every day in their lives? What is it? If you can share it in the in the chat as well. What are the signs of an activated baptism in them? How are they living the baptism? A warmth and joy and love shared with each other they meet. A God-centered 
listening heart. When following the baptism, the, 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 the baptism covenant. Sharing the good news through action, living into abundance, sharing, caring for neighbors. Centered in prayer, deep listener, always leading from God's love. Presence. Their ability to recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit no matter if they have a great day or a difficult one. Looking for who is left out and inviting them in. Father raised invitation to share doubt and faith, overcoming difficulties and loss while joyful, holy listening. From, from Galatians 5, from the fruit, but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. Vulnerability, authenticity, willingness to name the truth, easy or not, everyday prayer life. Make sure to uh, see. Prophetic witness, witness. Thank you for sharing those um those thoughts um we we recognize that um baptism um is not something that um happened in the past but it's something that we live we, we live every day uh and um and there, there are ways in which we, and Baptist for Life was all, all this, was um, how to live um, and practice those spiritual practices that um, um, build all those um, characteristics that, that you mentioned um, uh, into our daily lives. When there is a demonstrated sus sustained commitment to discernment practices, um, to see vocation uh, as calling to fullness of the baptized life, uh, faith in action, as you also mentioned in some of your uh, comments. Uh, all those marks um, uh, are important in the way we live our baptismal promises. But there are also like, we experienced also that um, it was important for some of our groups and congregations to um, mark baptismal anniversaries um, uh, um, to, to connect with um, God parents on a frequent basis uh, and to reactivate uh, those connections that were made during the baptismal celebration um, and that that um, make uh, this experience um, more meaningful uh, for families and individuals. Um, and so some of the resources that we are sharing are uh, mostly to, to accomplish that. Um, Thanks, Jarnell. I, I was struck as you were putting your comments in chat, how we know we know it when we see it in action. And I think as a person who grew up in the Episcopal Church, I think one of the things that has made me so sad um, in my life has been how private people feel they have to be about their spiritual practice. That, you know, I certainly grew up in a, in a family where we went to church a lot. My parents were served in many roles, but we didn't really talk about Jesus. We didn't comfortably read scripture together. Um, so part of what Baptized for Life did was try to accompany people into their daily lives, their homes, and, and give them a sense that it's okay to try and to be curious about the spirit moving in each other's lives and let children lead. And so there are corporate shared practices that are simple, but when we use them, our muscles get stronger, right? And then our public lives of witness, our courage to do the right thing in the face of injustice grows. And, and it's this is not, as I said at the beginning, rocket science. And yet we need, I need this conversation on a regular basis to remind me to live that way, right? And we're hoping it's helping you do that too. 
So before we go, we want to share you some more resources, some things that we think um, might be encouraging to you. One of the things you will find in the packet that you um, receive or in the Google, Google file is something that is called a Christian life of faith, colon, thresholds along the way. And some of you on this call are well aware of this resource. It's something that a number of us who are Christian formation leaders across the Episcopal Church came together under the leadership of our colleague, Judy, Julie Lytle, some years ago, to create a resource that would help people identify where they need help in growing deeper and further in their life as a Christian. And so it's a resource that has a grid in it, basically, where you can map yourself in areas of Christian identity and practice and say, I really don't know a lot about the Bible, or I need to know more about vocation, or I'd like to know about church history. I don't know what the Episcopal Church believes, and I wish I knew where it came from. It's a, it's a tool you can use for yourself, and it's a tool you can use in your groups um, to help people not just have sort of episodic formation, but deepening continual formation in ways that they are desirous for and in ways that are helpful to you as a community. So I commend that resource to you. And then there's another one that we've developed from our resources in Baptized for Life. And that really is what we've been focusing on for this last year. Um, our active work with our congregations ended in October of 2022. Uh, we were able to get an extension on our grant because of COVID. Uh, to finish up some of the resource work that we really wanted to do as we transitioned this learning into activating baptism in the wider church. Uh, so alongside what we did with the retreat house, we also are working with a sociologist to create a survey. It's called the Baptismal Vows Index. Uh, and this is a sociologist noted author, Josh Packard, Dr. Josh Packard and his research team from Fractal Insights. So he summed it up. He did a proposal for us um, of how he viewed how this would be uh, as we were in the planning stages of this. It's, it's now uh, deep in the work of getting done. But I wanted to read to you a quote that he had because I feel like it sums up really well. So um, Dr. Packard notes, based on a mixture of empirical and anecdotal evidence, there is reason to believe the congregations that ask more from their members are actually doing better, even in an era of general disaffiliation and institutional decline. With that in mind, Baptized for Life is looking to create and validate a scale measuring how people live out their baptismal vows according to the covenant made in the Book of Common Prayer. The goal is to provide congregational leaders and individuals with a tool they can use to self-assess their religious commitments and abilities and learn where they might grow. So right now, work is underway to build, test, and validate a scale that can be easily applied. The current timeline for this project's launch is early spring of this year, and the Department of Lifelong Learning looks forward to sharing more information with you as it becomes available. And our hope is that you will help us pilot it, try it out, give us feedback. Um, the idea is not to create the super Christian. It's not to like say, well, I got a higher score than Kim did, and therefore God loves me more, and I'm a better Christian. Um, not at all. It's it's a self-assessment instrument or a group instrument that we hope will help put legs on the vows that we take, and will help people understand how really radical and countercultural they are and give us some strength to be more courageous in the lives as Christian disciples in the world. So some people will love it and will, you know, people love horoscopes. They love to read about themselves. Some people won't want to touch it with a barge pole and all of that is fine. But we feel that there's a gap there um, between the promises, the book, the service, the experience, and the lived experience of people who are trying to be faithful to those vows. So we think it would be a helpful instrument and we would love you to help us consider that. As we, as we continue to practice. And finally, a resource that is familiar to, I've seen some names here on the, on the chat who are with us, um, people who are part of Baptized for Life, Maureen and Larry, others of you will know, Jan definitely will know about this. In COVID, and because we were already a dispersed community that met on Zoom regularly, the people, the wonderful gift of the retreat house uh, offered to us something called the well. And we have been offering it consistently on and off since we began it about three years ago. 
but it is basically a one hour session online of quiet gathering. It's a chance for silence, for scripture and for sharing around a piece of gospel text or a piece of scripture text from the lectionary for that week, facilitated by one of our spiritual directors. And it's a drop-in session. You don't have any expertise. You don't have to come for six weeks in a row. You come when the spirit moves you. And we just finished a season of the well last this last Tuesday, and we will begin again in Lent. So you can be looking for an invitation to join the well. The idea there is that you come as you are, and you share as you are comfortable. But we have had such diverse people join us. Uh, we had someone from Trinidad and Tobago log on this last few weeks. Uh, we've had people who we've never met before hear about it by word of mouth. The hope is that it's a place of contemplative practice that we can offer you alongside the urgency and busyness of your life. So there's a template for the rhythm of the well in your packet. You can do something like the well right where you are. You don't have to come to ours but we offer it to you as a model that our dear friends at the retreat house have developed for us. And we have found to be incredibly valuable. As we are closing this time together, um, we invite you to, to think about yourselves and what is your um, next faithful step um, as a baptized disciple? Uh, what is that that you are discerning right now for your life, for, for your spi spiritual life? What is the, the need that you have been um, recognizing in your spiritual pattern? And if you can um, if, if you can share it in the chat if you if you want, or you can create a note for yourself in front, in front of your computer um, of um, what is that next faithful step? for you um, as a baptized disciple? What is that that you are longing for, that you are dreaming? Um, also thinking that um, baptismal identity is not about um, another task in our calendars, but it is about who we are. It is about how we are being and what are we becoming and not what, what we are doing necessarily. Some of, some of you are sharing. Thank you for that. I will share some of the comments that have are being shared. Moments. And let's see now. Some people are saying, I really enjoy the well. How to ready myself for a holy land. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, there are resources being shared in the chat, so thank you very much. Just have a time, even if it is um, if it is not now, just to think about what what would be your next faithful step, uh, and um, and try to reconnect with that need as uh, spiritual need in your life. And now I invite you to to pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit, you have bestowed upon these, your servants, the forgiveness of sin and have raised them, raised them to the new life of grace. Sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage and will to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. And this is a prayer that we uh, uh, pray together when we have 
someone to be baptized in our congregation. So we want to be reminded again of what the church and all of us wish uh, and pray for, for those who are going to enter into the body of Christ. We are so grateful to you all for being here. And we know this was just a very quick brush with the significance of baptism and how to activate it in your life and in your ministry. And we are here. Um, we're not going anywhere. We being Virginia Seminary, the Department of Lifelong Learning, the Baptized for Life team that is continuing to live faithfully into our vocations as best we can. And we want to walk with you and we would love to learn from you. So these are some ways that you can join us um, in the near future or on a regular basis. Um, we have a newsletter that comes from Lifelong Learning that is probably how you heard about this. But if you're not on that, please do sign up for it. You'll get it once a month. We will not bother you. We will not spam you. We will not ask for money, um, but we'll just invite you to learn with us and share resources and some of our resources with you. We have on-site, online, and on-demand programming, and these are some of the things that are coming up in the near future this month, and you are most welcome to join us at any and all of them that are either geographically proximate to you or online at times that are convenient for you. More information on each of those is on our Lifelong Learning website. So I want to say thank you to my friends and my colleagues, Kim, and to Joy Mel, and to every one of you that made time to be with us this hour blessings on you and may it be a holy Lent. May this be a season for you when you remember that you are beloved of God, that you are called by name and that you are worthy and that your gifts are needed. Be well.